How many, how many, how many of you could hold the note as long? Yes, Terry. Huh? She's done that ever since I've known him for 100 years, man. I thought he'd get, thought he'd get older, it would be gone, but I just... I love your worship, guys. Love you guys. These two are special to me. We've done stuff together forever, man. Forever, right? Yeah, right. We walked with Paul and Peter, all them dudes, man. <laughs> I had uh, dinner last night with, with Sandy, one of my uh, granddaughters who led the, the team to Uganda uh, a couple of weeks ago. And what God is doing over there is just phenomenal. Sandy and Tom are leaving in August with, uh, I think, four from here and four from their church in Turlock for uh, an extended time over there. So pray. And I, I'm disappointed we can't see. It's just a five-minute video of Sandy talking, telling you what's going on. So uh, pick it up on, on Facebook and the web page. All right? So it's, um, I watched it yesterday, and I was crying when I was watching it. So just seeing what, what God is doing. Man. If you want to take your Bibles with me. Turn to the book of Philippians. I want to I want to start a discussion with you this morning. I want to start a conversation um, <clears throat> with you. And we're going to go. We're going to be in the book of Philippians for a while. It's not going to be a verse by verse. We'll, we'll cover probably the whole book and the, 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 what's in it. But I, I, there's just some things in this book that I that I think we need to hear. We need to. Th this book was was written to a to a church. It wasn't written to correct things like Corinthians was or, or, Gentile, or Galatians, um, but it was written to a church that was just kind of hurting a little bit, and they were confused about some things of Paul and his ministry, and there were some things being said, some slander things, and different things, and, and so he writes this, and um, this is possibly the last book that was written in the New Testament. There are some that say 2 Timothy was written after this particular book, but it's probably the last book that was, was written or the second to last book that was written that's, that's in the New Testament. And uh, I think Paul knew that his time was short. I think Paul knew that um, there was going to be a time that he wasn't going to be able to share anymore, wasn't going to be able to write anymore, wasn't going to be able to teach anymore. And, and, and there are just some, some great things you know, a lot of the sayings, a lot of the verses that every one of us quote, you know, can, can be found here in, in uh, Philippians uh, chapter 1, verse 6. It says, um, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work, has begun a good work in you, will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. 121 says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Chapter 2, verses 12 to 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. And, and it just goes on and on and on. And uh, uh, Look at verse 11. Now, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be based. I know how to abound everywhere. And in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul wrote this book in prison. It tells us in verse 7 of, of ch chapter 1. This is significant. <clears throat> Paul is, and this is so important, Paul is inseparable from his message. Paul is going through much suffering. He's under house arrest. It tells us he's chained. You know, he's, he's uh, guarded by the, by the Praetorian guards, the, the elite of the elite, and they're, they're with him there, you know, probably in his house, but it's house arrest, but he can't do anything, and he's in chains. And uh, it, it's, it's incredible. Uh, there is a theological position that, that states things like... Uh, if, if you're doing well and you're right with God, you will have no suffering. Huh? And if you're not right on, you're going to suffer. How many believe that, man? Huh? Well, Paul really shows that so much in error here. Uh, Paul in jail poses serious doubts to, to that particular gospel. 
So in this book, he has a whole lot to say about this. Like in verse 29 of chapter 1, he says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. You love that verse, don't you? And chapter th 3, verse 10, I, that, I, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings be conformed to his death. So, we, we see these Philippians are, are having a bit of a problem. It's of just understanding some things, understanding why Paul's message, understanding what his message is all about. Uh, they were beginning to have a little bit of, of hesitation in their spirits. Look at verse 28 of chapter 1. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's not the one I want. Let's see. Well, trust me, it's there, okay? And not in my terrified, but, you're, but not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation and that from God. And that word terrified there in, in some of the translations will say um, uh, frightened, uh, skittish maybe would be the word they were they were getting a little bit where they they weren't really sure they were getting a little bit uncertain about about Paul's teaching and because of what's going on he's saying that people are talking about it here's the deal guys anytime we get our confidence down anytime we don't have confidence in the truth and the the validity of the Word of God what happens is our peace and our joy begins to fade away. When we start being controlled by the circumstances, we start being controlled by the, the things that are going on, we, we start just looking at, at situations instead of listening to the word and, and, and standing on the solidness of the word where he says in the midst of that trial, I will never leave you, I will never forsake you. And, and we need to stand on that. And when we start doubting that a little bit because all of a sudden Paul has shared some things and they've, they've listened to the teachings of Jesus through the apostles and, and all of a sudden they see Paul arrested. And so they're questioning, are, are these things true? Are, are the things we've learned really true? Is his message really right on? Because if it was right on, uh, probably he wouldn't be in this, in this situation. So the Philippians are beginning to lose their peace and their joy and their confidence. That simply means they were, they were losing their balance. So Paul, through this entire letter, is, is talking about that. When we begin to lose our confidence, we begin to lose our peace, and we begin to lose our joy, that leads us to the next step, which is strife. Anytime we're discontent, all right? Anytime there's no joy and there's no peace, unity begins to dissipate. Look at chapter 2. Um, Verse 14 for a minute, okay? Do all things without complaining and disputing. So Paul is saying, you know, when you, when you lose your perspective, when you lose your, your, your vision, when you lose the, the, the reality and the understanding that we've been, we taught it for seven weeks, when you lose the reality that you are living in the presence of God, and you are attempting to constantly acknowledge that and experience that, you will be in his presence, there is fullness of joy. And if we're living in his presence, the joy won't slip away. The peace won't be gone. And the, and the quarrels and the disputes and the, the, those kinds of things will be gone because we're, 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 not, we're not dealing with each other like the world deals with each other. We're dealing with each other, understanding that we are both bought and children. We've been bought by the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And, and somehow, we won't let a dispute. We're going to work this together. Pretty soon, Paul mentions a couple of people that were having disputes in this church. Wouldn't you like to have your name written down there? These are the people who are causing a problem. But he talks about them. And he ta but he does it in such a kind way that it's, it, it wasn't pointing anything. He was just making an, 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 a point there. Okay. So how is Paul, over the next several weeks for us to understand, going to, to, to um, uh, deal with these things? Well, 
the Philippians were beginning to have a temporal mindset. Look over in chapter 3, verse um, 18 and 19. For many walk, of whom I have told you often, and now tell you even more weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ, whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind on earthly things. So when we're discontent, when there's no peace, when there's no joy, when we're involved in, in strife, all of a sudden we begin to fill our lives with temporal things. We begin to fill our lives with other things to, to try to somehow uh, fill that, that, that disappointment or fill that longing, fill that, that hurt that's going on. So what Paul does is he simply tells how God is working in their lives to change their mindset. And it's so exciting as you, as you go through this book and you see how God begins, or Paul begins to reveal to them, this is how God is working in your life. We have an understanding of how God works. If we have an understanding of how God works, then we can prove what is excellent, know the things that count, chapter 4, verse 18. I'm going to deal with these for the next several weeks. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-smelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. So, you know, when we're walking in that, we know what's important, and we, we know what's going on. Remember, any time faith begins to waver, any time we lose our confidence, selfishness takes over, that breeds discontent, we lose our joy and peace, which brings strife that results in greed. So Paul is out to restore their confidence, and he does that by, by describing how God works. See, if, if you know God, if you know God's in everything, then you can have peace. So Philippians deals with selfishness. It deals with lack of unity. It, it deals with this drive for protection of self-righteousness. And, and it answers those, those three things. Now, I want you to go back, and we're going to look at verse 1. All right? Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ. That, that word bond servants there, you've heard it shared before. That just simply means servant. Now hear me out on this, guys. I'm going to say some some radical things over the next several weeks that you're going to have to just kind of chew on for a while to see if you understand or if you accept them or not. I know you'll understand, but if you're going to accept them or not and understand, when he says bond servants, he's talking about it's that's that's not a servant; it's a bond slave, and a slave could make absolutely no move in their culture. A slave could make no move, do nothing, could not make a decision without the approval or the authority of their master. And when Jesus Christ bought you, when he bought me, the Bible says we are no longer our own. We have been bought and paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ, and we are servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what this whole series on, the, on, on, on living in his presence is about. <clears throat> we need to begin to live in a way that we make every decision, we make every choice, we make every reaction Everything that we do is based upon the reality that Jesus Christ is here and he's involved. I'm not, it's, we, we, we read verses, we quote verses, <clears throat> and I really believe it's time that we live like the Bible tells the truth. Okay? Are you hearing what I'm saying? I really believe that with my whole heart. There are so many Christians, that, and, and we live like practical atheists because we, we quote the verses and we say the things, but we're not living it. We're not living in the way that God wants us to live. And we, we, we quote the verse, yeah, steps of a righteous man or ordered of the Lord. Well, what an incredible thing. What's a righteous man? A righteous man who is living under the authority of Jesus Christ and choosing to be obedient to what he has called him to do. And then as I take my steps, I can have total confidence that he's going to direct my path. That if I go through that valley, if I'm in that pit, if I'm in that grief, if I'm in that situation, if I'm in that pain, <clears throat> it's going to be okay. Because I know 
He's directed my steps. Easy, Chuck. Don't go too far the first, first week because they won't come back, man, okay? <laughs> to all the saints, okay, what are saints? They're called out ones. Saint means we're set apart for the purpose of God. God is not set apart for our purpose. We are set apart for his purpose. He has created all things. All things have been created for and by him. Everything was created for him. He was, we were created for his good pleasure. And so many of us think that he's there for our good pleasure. And how many people I've talked to saying, well, I don't know. And I prayed and God didn't answer my prayer. He doesn't have to answer your prayer, man. When we pray, we're, we're wanting him to conform us into his image. It's not a matter of trying to get him to do what we want to do. And so we need to understand what it really means to be a Christian. Now, see, my problem is, I, I've decided a long time ago that I want absolutely nothing to do with American Christianity. I want everything to do with Bible Christianity. And a lot of what we have applied to Christianity is Americanism. And, and that will not get us to heaven. All right? We need to surrender. We need to give up. We need to be servants. We need to do what he's called us to do instead of living lives expecting God to put everything in, in the little bucket that we want him to put it in and everything's going to be wonderful. He's, as we were talking about it this morning, he is creating, you know what's going on in our lives right now? He's preparing us for eternity. We're going to be here for a short period of time. You know, 70, 80, 90, 100. Oh, I don't want that, one, that long. I'm good right now, man. But that's so short compared with eternity. And so he's preparing us. The grief we go through, the pain we go through, the disappointments we go through, the pits we go through, the glories we go through, that is all in preparation. We're learning now. And the more we learn, the transition is going to be that much easier because we're going to see him face to face, but we're going to be understanding and prepared for that a bit. So, you know, we're always trying to get out of as, as Christians. We, we've been taught in America that, you know, it's just God's an American and he loves us and, and everything's going to be fine. man. And I just don't think that's totally true, man. Grace to you and peace from our Lord and Father, the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know what grace and peace is and why it's in that order. We've talked about that. But look at this. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Whoa, I looked at that and said, whoa, man. He's writing to a church that, hasn't, that right now isn't totally accepting everything he's saying. They're questioning some stuff. And he writes to them and he says, every time I think of you, I praise God. Wow. I want to be able to say that. I want to be able to say that every time I think of you as a church, as individuals, I want to praise God because I know God's doing a work. I know that you're in his kingdom. I know that God's working on us. And, and I thought that was such an incredible verse, man. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Ah, oh, that's the body of Christ. We've lost that. Always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Oh, my word. Every time he prayed, he said, I am joyful. Every time I pray for you, I am joyful. I'm filled with joy. Every How many of you can say that's true in your life right now? Have you ever prayed for anybody? And as you were praying them, you were just filled with joy. Think about it, man. How about your husband? I'd see some of you wives shaking your head. No, I, I understand. I'm sorry about that. But, you know, maybe praying for your husband or your wife or, or your kids and, and there's a joy. And, and I can understand that when it's somebody we know. Maybe that's happened and it's just, it, it's not a, it's just a, a, a joy that, that comes into your life. And I've, I, I've prayed for grandkids and just and all of a sudden there's a, there's a joy and it's, I just feel so good as I'm praying for them. Well, that's, that's really cool. But that's not what this is saying. He's praying for the church. He's praying and he's writing to the church in Philippi. And he says, every time I pray for you, I'm filled with joy. How many times do you, 
that praying for somebody in this place, or, or you, every time you think about this place, or you pray for, or for the body of Christ in the world, is there a joy? Is, is, is there just a, and it's, it's, it's this, the, the concept here that he's leading to is a, it's a joy of, a, of, of overwhelming joy. It's a joy of, wow, you know? I think in the book of Acts where it talks about the early church, and it said they were together every day, and breaking of bread, listening to the apostles' teaching, and, and so forth. And um, it, it leaves the impression there that there was a, a, a an excitement in the church about being together. And, and I wonder how often any of us, do, 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 are we really in the place where we look at people and we get joyful, even if not we get joyful because we remember where they were and where they are now? Are we really that concerned about salvation? Are we really that concerned? Are we really in tune to the truth is there is a heaven for us who know Jesus and there is a hell for those who reject, reject him and don't? Are we really, have we, have we moved beyond that? Is that not politically correct to talk about hell anymore? You know who talked about hell most in the Bible? Jesus. Because he didn't want anybody to go there. And are we that excited when we see somebody make a confession for him? And we need to understand that what Paul is saying here is, is really what God desires for his church. God desires his church to be more than a, you know, um, a 60-minute event once a week to celebrate being redeemed for eternity. That just makes no sense to me anymore, man. And so many of us have reduced it to that. It needs to be a life. It needs to be a lifestyle. It needs to be, I, 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 I still, I, I'm feeling that, you know, I got, I got through this, this uh, s series on living in his presence and experiencing his presence, but I know that's going to be the foundation of everything I teach the rest of my life because I think it all starts there. I can't move without him. I wake up in the morning and before I put my feet on the floor, because that takes about 10 minutes, but before, before they get there, man, I'm, I'm, I'm saying, Lord, I give you this day. I'm a, I'm a mess, man. I, I could mess this day up if, if, you're not, if you're not going with me. I could really and, and make some mistakes. I make mistakes when you're with me, but you know how bad I'd be if you weren't there. Man. So please lead me, guide me, and remind me all day of your presence. When I get that phone call, when I hear that, when I feel that, when I, when I fall there, God, please, let me re re remember that you're there. Let me choose to remember that. Always and in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. Boy, I love that. For your fellowship in the gospel for the, from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. God is working in you right now. Do you know that? God is at work in you right now. Can you just say with me, God is working in me right now? God is working in me right now. What is he doing? I don't know what he's doing in there. Some of you, I'm a little confused what he's doing in there. But <laughs> God's working in you right now. Paul was confident. Three things. He was confident in God. He was confident that God was working in you and he was confident that he would complete it until we see Jesus face to face. Somebody has said it, it's that long because it'll take that long for some of us to get there. You know. But 
We need to understand that. I mean, that to me is, is so exciting. It's more exciting than anything I can think about, man, is that God is working in me. He's working in you right now. He's doing stuff. Just listen. Get in the words. Let's see what he's saying to you. And listen to him because he wants to do some things. I'm not saying he wants to answer all your prayers. I'm not saying he wants to give you everything you want. God, want, what does he want to do? He tells us in Romans 8, 29, what does he want to do? What's his purpose in our lives? To conform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Do you understand the one thing? I'm calling this series One Purpose, okay? And I believe there's one purpose in, in, in this book and, and basically in our lives. And let me tell you what that purpose is. That purpose is simply this. Uh, well, look, look at verse 8. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you with all of the affection of Christ. That's what Christianity is all about. Christianity is all about the life of Jesus Christ. It's Christ in you. And the one purpose is for us to be being changed from glory to glory by the Holy Spirit. One God's purpose is is to, for us to grow in the very nature of Jesus Christ, that we should be speaking, living, thinking the very character and nature of God. We're going to fall short of that, but that's the goal. You know, we, we get excited. You know, we get excited when, when, when people get saved here on Sunday mornings and stuff, and that that's great, but you know this... I don't think the church was ever really designed for that. I think the church was designed for us to come and, and uh, be together, fellowship, get strengthened by each other, praying for each other, getting stronger, and going out with the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And people should be being saved every single day through the lives of the people in this place if we are truly doing what God has called us to do. I, I hesitate to, to read something to you, I, and I, I will probably be criticized by this. <laughs> it won't be the first time. And, um, but I want to read something that, that I found. Um, this is uh, written by Chuck Swindoll. Okay? Uh, so there's my disclaimer right off the bat. It's not me. But as I read it, I thought, wow, I don't know how to correct it for us. I don't know how to change it. All I know is that I want to be changed. I, I, I want to be a tool. I, I, I want to just represent him. I want to speak what he wants me to speak. I want to go where he wants me to go. I, I, I want to do what he wants me to do. That's all. I, I don't, I'm, 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 it, that should be for all of us. I mean, there's little verses like, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. Why do we spend 99% of our effort trying to get these things added unto us? When he said, if we just seek his kingdom first, he'll take care of that. I've never understood that. Sure, we're supposed to work. Absolutely, we're supposed to be on the job. No doubt about it. And be the best person there. Absolutely. But we're seeking his kingdom first. And the stuff you're striving about, it's now his responsibility. I love it being his responsibility. I mean, even, you know, this is not a thing on tithing, and I don't, we very, we don't ever talk about it. We should talk about it more. But um, just because what church has always been, I hesitate. But um, when I started tithing years ago, I realized that now I'm responsible for being a good steward. Absolutely. I'm not just responsible for that. It's not just that 10% I give is God's. The other 90% in my life, I believe, is still God's. So I want to use it wisely in the way he wants me to. But I'm not in his debt. I don't want to be in his debt. I want to do what I'm supposed to do. And whatever it is, I want to do what I'm supposed to do. I want to be obedient to that. And then the courts, the ball's back in his court. And I love that, man. So listen to this. I don't want to be responsible. Take that. How many of you want me to read this? 
How many don't? Well, majority has it. We've got to read it. I didn't, I didn't want to. Now it's your fault, okay? So don't blame me because you voted for it. An old Marine Corps buddy of mine, this is quoting Chuck Swindoll, to my pleasant surprise, surprise, came to know Christ after he was discharged. I say surprise because he cursed loudly, fought hard, chased women, drank heavily, loved war and weapons, and hated chapel services. A number of months ago, I ran into this fellow, and after we talked a while, he put his hand on my shoulder and said, you know, Chuck, the only thing I still miss is that old fellowship I used to have with all the guys down at the tavern. I remember how we used to sit around and laugh and drink a pitcher of beer and tell stories and let our hair down. I can't find anything like that for Christians. <clears throat> I no longer have a place to admit my faults and talk about my battles where somebody won't preach at me and frown and quote me a verse. It wasn't one month later that in my reading I came across this profound paragraph. The neighborhood bar is possibly the best counterfeit that there is to the fellowship Christ wants to give his church. It's an imitation, dispensing liquor instead of grace, escape rather than reality, but it is a permissive, accepting, and inclusive fellowship. It is unshockable. It is democratic. You can tell people secrets and they usually don't tell others or even want to. The bar flourishes not because most people are alcoholics, but because God has put into the human heart the desire to know and to be known to love and be loved, and so many seek a counterfeit at the price of a few beers. With all my heart, the writer concludes, <clears throat> I believe that Christ wants the church to be unshockable. A fellowship where people can come in and say, I'm sunk, I'm beat, I've had it. Alcoholics Anonymous has this quality or churches too often miss it. Now, before you take up arms to shoot some wag that would compare your church to the corner bar, Stop and ask yourself some tough questions like I had to. Make a list of some possible embarrassing situations people may not know how to handle. A woman discovers her husband is a practicing homosexual. Where in the church, she can, where in the church can she find help where she's secure with her secret? Your mate talks about separation or divorce. To whom do you tell it? Your daughter's pregnant and she's run away for the third time. She's no longer listening to you. Who do you tell that to? You lost your job and it was your fault. You blew it, so there's shame mixed with unemployment. Who do you talk to? Financially, you were unwise and you're in deep trouble, or a man's wife is an alcoholic, or something is as horrible as getting uh, back the biopsy of the surgeon and it reveals cancer and the prognosis isn't good, or you had an emotional breakdown. To whom do you tell it? We're the only outfit that I know that shoots its wounded. We can become the most severe, condemning, judgmental, guilt-giving people on the face of planet Earth, and we claim it's in the name of Jesus Christ. And all the while, we don't even know we're doing it. That's the pathetic part of it all. My purpose in my conversation with you over the next several weeks, we're going to be really talking about why are we here? What is the church? What is the church all about? What is our purpose? Why do we exist? God forbid that it's so that we can be like we've done our service and we've spent our hour together. And I really don't know. I don't. And, and what is so cool? I don't have any answers. We're just going to have the word. We're going to let the word unfold before us. <clears throat> and we're going to let the word speak to us. We're going to let the Lord speak to us. Because I believe that's true. I believe we have so many hurting people who are afraid to, to speak and talk and share because we have an image. I was talking to a young girl this week and she said, I'm just, I'm tired of, of, of trying to make sure I look exactly right every place I go, make sure I'm wearing the right clothes that are you know, in at this particular time, it's the latest tradition, it's the fad, making sure that I say the right things and enjoy the internet in the right way. And I'm, I'm just, I'm just in her, you know, action. So I'm just tired of it. I said, probably one of the best things I can ever tell you is to be yourself. Learn to be yourself and be comfortable with yourself. Don't try to 
perform. And, and that's my goal for this church. We don't have to perform for God. He performed for us on the cross. He accepts us just like we are. We're in the process of growing into his image, but that doesn't mean we ever become self-righteous and we're special. We're just sinners saved by grace that want to be led by the Spirit of God and allow him to speak to us and to lead us in what he wants us to do. And my prayer for this church is that we would, we would be real. We would be honest. You know, I know we don't have any, a lot of small groups and stuff, and I don't know if God's going to do that, but he's going to have to do that. You know, and, and we'll get you groups that you can get into, I guess, but I, I don't know. I, I just, I, I think that should just be part of who we are. I think we should self-initiate koinonia. Can't we do that? Can we just invite people out to dinner? Let's talk. Let's be together, you know, and, and be open. And we don't have to be the answer for everybody. When somebody shares something deep with us, we don't have to, you know, the, I, we're afraid we're going to say the wrong thing, right? We're afraid we're not going to know what to say. Why don't you say that? I don't know what to say. I don't want to say the wrong thing, but I can sure be praying for you. And I sure care. I'll walk it through with you, man. Heck, we have the answer, and his name is Jesus. And and I'm too old and I'm too tired to to just try to build church and play church. I, I, I just I just want to be true. And I want to I want to know what the word of God says. And I want to walk in I want to walk in forgiveness. I want to walk in love. I want to walk in acceptance. I don't want to. I don't want to be judging. I don't want to be critical. I believe my whole heart that God's. He's doing some incredible things around here, but I, I don't think we've even seen. We haven't scratched the surface of what He wants to do. He wants to send us sheep that He doesn't know where to send right now. He's got little lambs He wants to bring into His kingdom. And he's trying to find places where they will be accepted and loved, wherever they're coming from. And, and that's what I want. That's what I believe the, the, the Lord wants, and I believe that's the direction that he wants to go. And, and again, I don't have a plan. We're just going to read the word together and see what he's saying to us. We want him to touch our hearts, and you know. It's so easy for us just to isolate ourselves. Just tough it out with Jesus. He didn't make us that way. So we have to hire somebody to listen to us or we have to pay somebody or we have to, you know, on and on and on, man. And when I think it's should be available just in the body of Christ, he's given us the gifts, each one differently so that we can minister to each other. And I think we're missing that. If I'm going to live in his presence, it's got to be, it's got to be here too. It's got to be everything I do living in his presence. And that's what I want for this church. So the one purpose the one purpose? To be conformed into the image of, of Jesus. That's the one purpose. That's what this series is about. That's the one purpose. To be changed. Being changed from glory to glory. As by the Holy Spirit. Sometimes that change is very minute. We don't even recognize it. From glory to glory. That means every time we experience his presence and recognize his presence, there's change. So if we're walking in his presence, there's going to be constant change. And for some of us, he could change us every single day and we're still not going to be good enough by the end we're going to see him. You know, there's so much to deal with. But even those little bits of change are great for me. You know. Father, He told us if uh, we built the house without you as the architect, the head foreman, we're going to build a monstrosity. It's not going to be what you want it to be. And it won't last. The winds will come. The storms will blow it away. That's true in our lives, individually, in our families, church. Unless you build it, Lord. That's all I'm saying today. We don't want to labor in vain. Build our families on you, Lord. 
teach us how to pray with our children and read your word with our children and 